Welcome to Shooting Spaces, a real estate photography podcast. Discussions on gear, technique, industry news, and interviews with the best in the business. Now, here are your hosts, Rich Baum and Brian Berkowitz. Hello and welcome to Shooting Spaces. I'm Brian Berkowitz from New York. And this is Rich Baum from Sacramento, California. And thank you for tuning in for another great episode. Uh, I think everyone's going to like this one, Um, a topic that gets discussed often. But um, before we get into it, Rich, (laughs) how's it going um, out there? I guess summer's summer's over, fall is upon us. No, uh, uh, in Sacramento, summer's not over until they tell you it's over. It's going to get hot again. And and, uh, I've just been shooting weddings, a lot of weddings, uh, loving my new sony camera for for shooting weddings and uh, by the way I'm, now, huh? well i got two of them now and they're working absolutely great but please everybody know i am totally not affiliated with sony so i'm uh i'm just doing it out of the the love in my heart for my switch and uh i was able to sell most of my nikon gear and and i'm really excited about this change but uh the weddings have been going great and uh sports is sports shootings coming up i've got a bunch of Spartan races I'm going to be shooting for, uh, the world championship in Lake Tahoe, we do, and we're going to be doing Pac Bell Park it, uh, in San Francisco, and uh, we got the big Sacramento uh, super uh, Spartan race, so that's going to be the a world lot championship of fun. Spartan race, huh? That that's in Tahoe idea. every year. I think we're doing it in November, October, and November, and one year, it, it, one year we had a lightning storms and hail. One year we had snow. One year we had sixty mile an hour winds on top of Squaw Valley Mountain Peak, and uh, it's always exciting. But it is so much fun to do, and I'm taking between. 10 and 15, 18,000 images a day and oh, wow. uh, ripping them up and loving it though. I just love doing I it. I think uh, shooting that would make me feel worthless and <laughs> completely out of shape <laughs> watching all these people. I tell uh, people I do 20, uh, 20 Spartans a year, but I don't run any of them. So, hey, look, you know what? A couple of years back, I did a Tough Mudder, but um, <laughs> I was in a lot better shape. That wasn't uh, after 10 years in marriage and two kids. So, yeah. and how's, your, uh, how's your week going? What's up? It's uh, good. You know, things are slowing down a little bit. This August was an insane, insane month for me. Probably the best month I've ever had of my business. So knock on wood, things are looking up. But I know it's not going to last like that forever. Um, September slowed down a little bit. But, um, you know, I'm going to keep grinding out till it really slows down. I think in New York here, it's going to be about end of October and end of me and mid to end of October, you know, till it gets really slow. So I'm trying to milk it as much as I can while I still have it. Well, I'll tell you one trick I do, and it really helps me out, is I will go through, and I did this yesterday, I will go through last year's calendar and the year before calendar and the year before calendar, and I'll just look at my my, um, statistics, how how busy was I? So Mm -hmm. sometimes when I'm not busy, I will look back going, oh, I wasn't busy last year, or I was busy last year. So kind of give it- Yeah, you know what? I don't mind some of the downtime though, because the truth is from- I guess November till March till it starts picking up. That's when I sit down and I really focus on the marketing side of my business. And, you know, I set, you know, for those four months every winter, I set myself a marketing goal where, you know, whether it's, you know, be number one on Google or this and that, um, you know, I set a goal for myself and I'll work, you know, the whole winter while it's slow on the shoot wise to get everything done from the marketing standpoint, whether it's updating my portfolio on my website, because during busy season, we all know no one has a chance to update their portfolio at all. So during the slow time, I do all that stuff, take care of my website. I I kind of get everything from the internally done that I, you know, I guess don't do or, you know, during during the busy season, I, I kind of just put it by the wayside. Yeah. So, you know, definitely if you are slow in the winter, like I am here in New York, take advantage and and do all the internal stuff that needs to be done. It's a part of all of our businesses. Yeah. And I want to say that I'm, I'm really, I know there's been uh, talk in, in the groups and people are always wanting to know about um, business, the business side of this. So I think Brian, we should uh, do a few podcasts and maybe invite some people that have small businesses and maybe medium sized businesses and large businesses and to see what suggestions they do or just get more into the business side of this. So I'm looking forward to those talks too. Sure. Yeah. I have somebody in mind actually out here in New York Mm -hmm. who runs a pretty successful, um, big real estate photography company that I work with every so often. So I'm going to see if I can get him on. And he has, I think 
eight or nine or 10 full-time photographers working for him. Yeah. So, um, I guess in our industry, that would be considered a big business. Um, but I will try to, uh, get him on in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. We'll, we'll get some good stuff coming up. So what we got today, Brian, we have another ask the guys, um, another fantastic one, a topic that gets covered very often and people are very, very opinionated on it are frequently. They? Yeah. I mean, I guess people are opinionated on every topic on these, uh, <laughs> Facebook groups, but, um, nevertheless, we have a question from Keith and without further ado, I will play it. Hi guys. I really enjoy your podcast and I appreciate you taking the time to share your knowledge. <laughs> I have a lot of questions, but I'll just ask two for now. One is why does HDR get such a bad rap? I have seen, heard, and read a few photographers mentioning it in a demeaning way, as if it were something to be avoided by anyone who calls themselves a professional. Okay, but why? They never explain why it is to be avoided. I'm new to photography. I was fortunate to get hired to build, uh, to shoot builder spec homes uh, using only HDR. And I'm receiving only compliments from the builders. They love it. So I just don't get it. Number two is I started out in this career path about a year ago wanting to do real estate video. And so I bought a used Panasonic GH4 for this purpose. But my first real opportunity for paid work is to do photography. And I'm finding that the GH4 takes great pictures. I know that its strength is video, but is it inferior to Sony, Canon, and Nikon for photography? If I want to continue doing real estate photography, should I get uh, a different camera and just keep the GH4 for video? Well, that's it. Thanks, guys. Wow, that is a great question, and um, I'm I'm going to reserve myself and let let you, Brian, go into it while I think of some really good stuff to talk about with uh, both why HDR is, is good or bad or why it has a bad rap and also uh, how you feel about the, the video, the camera that you want to use for stills. But uh, I first want to bring in, that was Keith Mitchell. And uh, thank you so much, Keith, for your very well put uh, question. And I'm going to throw this right in your court, Brian, and I want you sure. to start off. Answer yeah, away. I, mean, I think we should both answer the HDR question yeah, first and then move sure. on to the second right. one. But HDR, um, that is a very good. What's that mean? What does HDR stand for? High dynamic range. Mm -hmm. um, and it's weird because all it means is an image with high dynamic range. <laughs> and HDR, somehow or another, over the course of time, got associated with circus like images. And. Um, I don't know how um, HDR got a really bad um, stigma, I guess, if you can call it, attached to it. Um, but HDR is not bad. Um, I don't think, at least, or my opinion is sometimes at least HDR is some, not bad. you got to say sometimes it's not bad. Sometimes it is. It is bad. But the same thing. Well, with no, I think I think the method of shooting HDR is not bad. Mm -hmm. Now, do some people produce bad HDR results? One hundred percent. Yeah. But the, con the concept of HDR and shooting using high dynamic range images to produce your final image, all ambient, is, is not bad at all. And I do it very often. Um, I do it on a lot of my shoots, um, not so much in my real estate. Um, I mean, I have actually a couple, a lot of my commercial real estate jobs in the city and it's happening more and more in the city beating Manhattan where there's wall to wall floor to ceiling windows. They want me to just shoot all natural light. They want to show that off. You know, um, they don't want me to bring flashes in there. So for that, I'm shooting all bracketed images and you can theoretically call it HDR and I'm hand blending it and I'm not producing these circus like results. And there's no reason to say that I did not shoot this HDR. I mean, I shot a bracketed shot and I went in and I, um, you know, produced my final image using exposure blending. So, you know, I think the, the HDR, the term HDR kind of got associated with these very overly saturated results you get from Photomatics or one of these other companies that produce the software, but I don't think HDR is bad. And I think, I think, 
producing good, you know, you can produce good results using um, high dynamic range photography as a technique. Um, you can go, I mean, you can go to my Instagram page. It's, it's going to be hard for somebody to tell which ones were shot using, you know, lighting or which ones were shot using, I guess you can call it HDR or bracketed shots, which were all hand blended. But yeah, it, it did get a did get a bad stigma. I don't know why, but it's not a bad thing. And, you know, to answer Keith's question, I don't think, especially if your client wants it, I don't think you should shy away from um, shooting that if that's what your client wants. If your client wants that and you're, he's happy with the results you're producing, then go ahead. Um, if you're getting paid for your shoots, then you're professional. And for someone to say, if you shoot HDR, you're not a professional photographer, um, I don't think that makes sense. You know, if you're a photographer that goes out and you get paid for your work, you're a professional photographer. Even if your work is bad, you're still a professional photographer. You might not be a good professional photographer, but you're a professional photographer. So, I think at the end of the day, you know, you do what's best for you. Everyone has their own methods. Everyone has their own techniques. You know, even on a lot of my designer shoots, and I've been posting a few of these lately. I don't know if you've seen these, Rich. Um, a lot of my designer shoots, I'll shoot um, five bracketed shots, hand blended, and then what I'll do is I'll light paint with a hot light or a continuous light to give them more natural look than flash. Um, and, you know, the base for that shot is a hand blended five bracket shot which then i obviously light paint so it looks like there's light added afterwards 100 percent. but the base for that is not a flash shot it's a ambient five bracket exposure uh, exposure blended shot um i do it all by hand but it's it's all okay. blended that way but brian uh, let me just jump in here one second i think we're missing a point i think that um really the distinction to me in hdr is not masking in ambient exposures it is using a program that does and i'm not going to get into the technicals because i'm not the technical guy to do this but i urge anybody that wants to learn about this to start re, you know doing research but look up tone mapping and look up the programs i find that if you let a program do everything for you do it you put all your images in there they, it does what it does and it spits out. That to me is HDR. And that is what's so hard to keep quality control on. I think no, what you're doing 100%. is, what you're doing is, is, and, and I, sometimes you can get great, great images that way using a program like uh, Photomatix or like Infuse. But I think that what you're talking about is something completely different, but I could be sure. wrong. Well, look, I've, I've used Infuse a lot and I still use it occasionally now. Um, you know, it's a great, I used it like two days ago or three days ago for a shoot. Um, I think Infuse is better than a program like Photomatix because it gives you a lot more natural mm -hmm. results. And, you know, when you finish using Infuse and you get these images, they're not obviously ready to send off to a client. They're all very flat and you have to add your own tweaks and have your own presets or whatever it is. But I think what I'm saying is, I, and I know I'm not going to change the philosophy of an entire industry or anything like that, but you know, HDR imaging is just a technique of using a wide dynamic range of shots to produce your final result. Mm -hmm. And somehow that got associated with using these softwares. You know, I just, while we're, while, while I was talking, I just literally Googled HDR and this is what popped up as a definition of HDR. High dynamic range imaging is a high dynamic range technique used in imaging and photography to reproduce a greater dynamic range of luminosity that is possible than is possible with standard digital imaging or photographic techniques doesn't say anything about using software to automatically infuse images together. But it's associated uh, with, with digital, but they were doing uh, H basically really doing HDR in film days too. Sure. Same thing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think HDR okay. kind of got I'll this bad stigma. Yeah. <laughs> I think it got this bad stigma with this software. And, and look, <laughs> a lot of these softwares do produce really, really awful results. And yes, is it quick and easy on a job to you know, go out, shoot a quick auto bracket, go home, throw it all into photomatics and send it to your clients. Sure. And if your clients are okay with that and you're able to make a living doing that, then by all means, all the power to you. Who am I to judge how anybody else makes a living? 
but it's gonna and this has come up a lot it's gonna be hard to grow and start you know if you're happy doing you know 15 20 of these real estate shoots a week and you're content then go ahead and do it if if hdr is working but if you want to eventually get into the higher paying design jobs and architectural jobs obviously producing these results with one of these auto softwares is probably not going to work out great for you in the long run sometimes it works out great Other times it doesn't. I left HDR because, and I used to do HDR, I I couldn't get consistent colors and consistent consistent looking images, quality of images, because some situations I just couldn't, I couldn't fix it. Let's take a step back a second, Rich. Weren't you a Photomatics ambassador slash (laughs) HDR educator? Okay. My my (laughs) history was, okay. Um, I am not the anti-HDR schnob that people think I am. I started off in my digital photography career and I learned this thing called HDR and I started working with uh, with Photomatics and I thought it was the second coming of uh, Mr. Mr. You know, Jesus Christ, I thought it was it was the greatest thing I'd ever seen. And I people even know that I said that that's the answer to, you know, to real estate photography. Um, I was was all in. I was being sponsored by I wasn't an ambassador, but I was given um, I was given uh, product codes and things for my workshop attendees to do HDR. But I was doing more. Most of it was really just for fine art. And that fine art, I look back and it was breaking all the rules. And it really, really was not quite over the top, but it was very, very HDR-ish. It was not too fine. uh, Not too fine, but it was what it was. And I was really into that. And then I incorporated it into real estate photography. And when I started, I was so excited. But the thing was, I didn't know what I didn't know. All my colors were not correct. All of my a gray wall, a, a, a tan wall could change five different shades of gray. And it looked like I was have smoke all over the walls and I had um, terrible views. And I and then I once I started realizing, especially doing designer shoots, I realized, oh, my gosh, I've got to make these colors look right. And where I could where I would not take a lot of time on site. I was in a hole in editing and I would spend hours and hours trying to dig myself out. And I finally came to the conclusion, I've got to figure out something. And then I learned everybody in the PFRE group on Flickr was uh, using lights. So I said, I got to learn because this HDR is not working out for me now. So that's where I came from. And the reason I moved was because I understood that in certain situations, you could shoot some houses with an iPhone. But I found that I could not get consistent results without using lights um, 100% of the time. So that's why I ended up going uh, to lighting. And I, I kind of went, got down on people for HDR. And that's my own, own uh, you know, hang up. And uh, I apologize to anybody if I've, if I've said that. But I'm a little more open to it now. And I've actually been doing a little bit of in-camera HDR uh, with my Sonys. And I think that there are some people, there was a guy on Flickr. Do you remember? I think his name is uh, Colin Cadle, Colin Cundell. You've told me about England. him. Yes. He's, he's the best. He was the master. And Colin, if you look him up, I wish I could remember his last name uh, correctly. I apologize, Colin. But he would make magic. And he was actually going to do a video. And I was so excited to learn, but he never did. And then there's people like Paula Cheese. And Paula Cheese, if you're out there, I've always commented that your work is 100% consistent and it's all HDR. And I think you use Photomatics, but you've got it down, girl. And I'm really impressed with that. So I think if it's working for you, go with it. But I think a big thing, um, Keith, is to really just be aware are you recreating real colors? Because what I teach him, what I'm into, is you've got to use lights to overpower the ambient to kill that color cast from the tungsten, from the fluorescent, the blue from the fluorescent, the blue from outside, the tungsten from this light, the the halogen from this light. You got to overpower all that and to get your colors right. Or I don't know how you're going to do it, but I know that some people do it with HDR. I'm just not the right person to do that. 
Do you ever use any of the software nowadays at all or none? I will occasionally, I have not plugged in uh, Photomatics for a couple of years and I have used Infuse GUI, which is a, a shareware, I think it's called shareware, and mm -hmm. you can use it as a plugin for Lightroom and it's HDR, um, so it is doing stuff for you. But it's very, very um, non-intrusive, and it really looks nice. And it's unbelievably how how believable how fast it is. Literally, it takes one to two seconds to infuse five bracket images. So you can do that. And I have been doing in-camera HDR with my A7 III. Let's say I'm up in an attic, and I've got to shoot it, and it's all wood, and I don't have the time to bring up lights up the steps of the attic. I shot HDR, in-camera HDR, and it looks really good. And I got that technique from Wayne Capilli, and uh, Wayne got me into all the things I get into. He's a great guy to follow. But uh, it has been working, and I will be doing more with it. But I found I've been doing it with my twilight shots, doing trying to do my normal twilight, single image images, and then doing an HDR. And it just isn't coming out the, the what I like. So... I'm just not, it ain't, it ain't for me, but uh, I'm still going to keep trying it. Yeah. You know what? You keep going at it until you find what works. That's, and I will that's bring on, really we're going to bring on one or two guests that are um, HDR aficionados. I might, might even be able to get Colin in, in England if he's uh, still doing it. I'll reach out to him because his work was absolutely amazing. So I will yeah, actually, I'd love to hear, I'll, as I mentioned, I'll let I'm you sorry. know who it is and I'll, I'll send you the website so you can put it on the show notes there, Brian. Oh yeah. Great. Yeah. I'd love to mm -hmm. see it. Cause as I mentioned, I, I do shoot a lot of that, um, for a lot of my commercial real estate, I shoot, um, by bracketed and some of them, depending on how quick of a turnaround time I need, I do use infuse. So, um, I am using these automated processes, but like I said, when it spits it out of infuse and it's done, we're not even close to done. There's still a lot of work that, I have to do to get it looking like a professional looking real estate image yeah. and not, well, you know, up to your, you know, up to, you know, everything you put out has to have some assembly looks, looks similar. It's your brand. And it's really important. Exactly. And I want to say, um, I see a lot of people lately, um, doing, uh, exteriors and they figure they're doing lighting inside, but they're still doing HDR outside. And I'm like, it's killing the beauty of your shot. I'm saying you can pull whatever you need out of a single, image or possibly two images done properly but no reason to do hdr for exteriors i think just uh you know shadows there are shadows in life and it and you can make it look really good so no for sure i think uh yeah and that's the biggest thing is with hdr that's i think that's the most obvious way you can tell when an image is hdr is when there's no real true shadows when they're just brought up so much that even the shadows are the same exposure as everything else and that's like the first most obvious sign that this was shot hdr and it looks a lot of times i actually commented on a few shots in the uh, groups today uh one guy i forget who it was but um his shots were just um, hazy. They were muddy and hazy. And that's exactly what you were talking about. The No shadows. And um, it's just, it, it's not for me. Let's just say that. But I know there are some agents that love HDR. And uh, I actually had one agent years ago, just she would call it, uh, you know, those funny photos, those real um those and, funny photos, and yeah nice. they she call them funny photos and the other one is um you know Kincaid uh, I think that that can be uh, at times at, at the beginning I thought that was a compliment but I, I ended up getting to the point where it was kind of a uh, a real rip saying that your images are looking like uh, Thomas Kincaid and uh you know it's true it was and it's something that now I I know what I know uh and now I've looked back going it didn't work for me. And I, I cringe at some of the old stuff I did. I did extreme HDR and I could say a word that you just have to bleep out, but <laughs> I, w I promise I'm not going to say it. Um, but, um, I think that I think, it, I think it's two words. <laughs> starts with a C. Um, anyway, <laughs> it ends with a V. Anyway, um, and I just want to say that, you know what, if it works for you, do it. And and also, you know, what you're doing, Brian, what you're doing in hand, hand blending 
uh, ambient images. I do that all the time, especially on really, really big, big shoots. If I'm shooting a government building or something where I just can't light it, forget it. I can't even do a Mike Kelly or a Sam Chen on there. I'm not even going to pop flashes off. I'm just going to go take a good bracket. But the thing is, most of the times, those kind of shoots and your designer shoots you're doing, Brian, they probably have really good lighting. They probably have dimmers. They probably have a wonderful lighting color palette. So it's something a little bit different than just going into doing a really bad uh, listing and you've got to shoot it with HDR with five different light color temperatures in the room. So, you know, two different things. No, for sure. All right. Well, I hope that gives people, excuse me, some insight. Oh, wait, we, we, we got one more question from Keith. Yeah, I was just closing out the, the HDR talk. Oh, but yeah, um, go ahead. anyway, going into the GH4, which is what he asked about. Um, to tell you the truth, and I think you would agree with me, Rich, um, I don't use Panasonic. I don't know much about it. Um, mm -hmm. I don't use the GH4. I never have, or may, may have a couple years back on a small video shoot, which is kind of what he referenced as far as using it for video. But, you know, I know you spoke dozens and dozens of times of, about using your A6000, which isn't you know, the top of the line camera for real estate shoots. So, um, I mean, talk to us about using the A6000. And my point in this is not that, you know, not for you to promote the A6000, but it doesn't have to be, a, you know, a, a Canon Mark IV or an A7 III or, you know, I guess a Nikon D4. It doesn't have to be that to go out and, and produce a good image. Absolutely. And I'm well known for, um, again, Wayne got me into shooting, um, Sony and I started with the a6000. I bought it for $349. I think open box from Best Buy and mm -hmm. um, It is a crop sensor. It is 24 megapixels. It is one thing it doesn't do well is uh, high ISO above like uh, I might go to 800 but um, You know, but the good thing is this kind of photography. You don't really need that you don't need because we're not shooting high ISO um, the a6000 is my day-to-day -day real estate photography camera. I shot it all day yesterday. I, one shoot I did use my, my, um, my Sony a7 III with a tilt shift, but, and I even have a tilt shift adapter for my a6000, but mm. it doesn't make a difference. I don't think you will see the difference. And I'm not using it because I'm trying to make a point going, oh, I can shoot real estate with anything. I love the camera and I'm also using an inexpensive Sam Yang lens. Someone asked me today and sent me an, uh, is this the right lens? It's for under $300. I think it's $279 now. And it's a great lens. And I use them because it's light, it's easy, it's cheap, and it's fast, and it's real fast tethering. Uh, I really love the A6000. So in answer to your question, where I know the GH4 is a, a renowned video camera, but I can't tell you why with the attributes that make it a great video camera. But I will say that I don't see any reason not to use that camera for your stills because it's not going to make a huge difference. Um, I think also... I'm using lighting and maybe I don't have to get as much dynamic range as another camera, like a top of the line, like my a7 III might have better dynamic range, but I don't think it really comes into play with my day-to-day -day real estate photography. So I say, go with what you've got. I would investigate it, but I don't think you need to go to a full frame whatsoever. I love my a6000. It's a crop camera and I love it. And I actually like it better because it's got a little more depth of field you know i can shoot at 7.1 and everything i never have to focus my sam yang lens i put it just shy of infinity i have a piece of tape on it and it's 7 point f 7.1 everything from three feet to infinity is in focus and i never change focus ever on that lens so it it's not the camera it's your technique and i think there are a lot of things like maybe a better lens you could get certainly better you know better lenses but i think in this game real estate i'm not talking designer i'm not talking also uh and i shoot all my twilights with my a6000 i'm shooting all my pole photography with it and uh i'm not shooting much video but i know it's a tolerable video camera but this was about stills and i think i would say go with your gh4 put it out there to the to the groups too and ask other people what they think but there's no reason you've got to get the cutting edge top of the line camera for real estate photography
No, hundred percent. And there's no way to really know how far you can push that camera until you go out and push that camera. Um, you know, until you get to that point where you say, you know, use it until you get to that point where you say, okay, this camera will not do it for me anymore, but don't upgrade your camera just because everyone else has better cameras. You know, I know we were talking earlier today, Rich, and I said, I ran out of time on my, my shoots, but I wanted to take my Canon M5 mirrorless, which I have, which is a, you know, a piece mm -hmm. of crap, um, $800 Canon mirrorless camera, which I use for my family. And I was, I want, I brought it with me today. I wanted to shoot a couple of real estate images on it just to show that, you know, it's not really the camera. Um, I mean, obviously the camera plays part of it, but it, you know, a lot of it is the technique and your lighting and everything else. Um, I just ran out of time and just needed to get home after a long day, but yeah, you know, go out and shoot with it and, and keep shooting with it until you get to that point where you know, you have to upgrade and that point will come, um, when you know, all right, you know, this camera is not cutting it for me. I need to start producing better results and booking better jobs, um, i.e. maybe designer shoots or architectural shoots, then you might say, okay, I need to go and upgrade the camera. But, you know, s start with what you have and go from there and just practice, practice, practice it. You know, if you, if you can master what you're doing with the GH4, it's only going to make your job easier when you get a better camera. So. Yeah. You could put my, um, shots from my Nikons next to the shots from my Sony a7 III and the a6000 and i really would be hard pressed for anybody to see any difference other than maybe in the dark uh in the shadows in the dark where you're dealing with noise but for me it's much more a, a product of function i just like the a6000 because it's so easy to use it's so the every little part about it it's just really easy much easier than my a7 III and it's just something i've really come to enjoy so yeah somebody yeah. said it in in one of the groups on a comment recently i forgot who it was but it might have been our good friend chris miller um so if it was you chris thank you and if it wasn't i'm giving you credit for somebody else i apologize <laughs> um but someone said if you put you know an image together from a you know a Nikon D4 or you know a Canon uh, Canon Mark IV or you know your Sony A6000, most probably no one's going to be able to tell the difference at the end of the day what what was shot with what. But with that said, I'm not going to go use my A6000 for a wedding or for sports or basically. I mean, I'll I'll take it on a trip. Actually, I took my A6000. It was in hindsight, I I wish I didn't, but I did it on a point i brought my a6000 with my two kit lenses to africa as my only camera because i was not prepared to bring the big guns my 400 or my 300 and i did and i regret it a little bit mainly because the lenses were the kit lenses and kind of crappy but you can use it for travel for family all kinds of things just don't expect to be shooting at iso 3200 my a7 III, i can shoot at iso 2 uh, 20 000. i've used wedding shots now at 20 000. um you know so you just got to use it where you want to use yeah, it but weddings, you know weddings you are different i, I don't see yeah. many circumstances in real estate where someone has to shoot higher than 2000 iso or 2500 oh, iso never exactly never. But, uh, yeah Awesome. All right, Keith. Well, well, thank you for your um, double question we had this week. Mm -hmm. And I think Keith's website is higherviewsimaging.com. If anyone wants to check him out, please go ahead and check out Keith Mitchell's work. Yeah. And when you guys, all you out there, come on, start calling in with your Ask the Guys questions. And uh, you can promote your website, you know, to have people check it out if you have a blog. And, and that's what it's all about. Just pass it around. Awesome. Well, Rich, it's been a pleasure again, like always. Pleasure's all mine, Mr. Berkowitz. Yes. Until next time, everyone, thank you for listening. Yes. And thank you all too. And you have a wonderful dog days of summer and, uh, you know, it's uh, going to go by real quick. So enjoy it Can get out there and shoot smarter, shoot faster, make more money, shoot better things and spend more time with your family or just go buy new equipment. It's fun. Too. Whatever works for you. This has been Shooting Spaces, a real estate photography podcast. Subscribe to this show and don't forget to leave us a review. You can also follow Rich and Brian on social media and at their website, shootingspacespodcast.com.